uh, it's especially an honor because, as uh, Kathy mentioned, I'm an old Army guy, so standing in front of a bunch of folks that are associated with the Navy is uh, a little bit intimidating, but uh, we're going to get through it. Um, as Kathy mentioned, I was assigned in Panama back in the early 80s as an Army judge advocate. For those of you who don't know, those are the Army lawyers. And I had the, the job of being a prosecutor, uh, which was a fantastic experience. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, then last year, in uh, the summer, uh, my church did a mission trip to Panama. And actually, Sharon Nobles was part of that as well. My wife and I went down there, and we spent about a week doing that, and then another week uh, sort of sightseeing. And so I had a lot of contact with Panama, and it was tough for me to start narrowing down what I was going to talk to you about tonight, because it is such an absolutely fascinating place. It's so, so multifaceted in, uh, in, in its culture and its history. and uh, so it was tough to come up with uh, topics that would not keep us here all night, uh, but I did. Um, so I came up with three. First, why is Panama so significant? What are some of the lessons learned from the building of the canal, which is one of the most important things that happened there? And finally, how has Panama changed since the United States relinquished control of the canal? So first, why is Panama so significant? Well. In, in the entire world, there's about 200 million square miles of land mass. Panama has less than 30,000. So it's not very big at all. And for those of us around here, we recognize that, right? Great state of Texas. Well, Panama would easily fit within the borders of the state of Texas. So it's not clearly not its size, and there's probably not a lot of, there are some resources, but not a lot. And so you're probably saying, well, Bill, obviously we know why Panama is significant. It's because where it is. It's its location. Well, you might be surprised to learn that it wasn't always there. In fact, it's really relatively new. Scientists think it's only about 2.8 million years old. Now, if that sounds like a long time, think for a second about how long it's been since dinosaurs were extinct. That's 65 million years ago. So in the grand scheme of things, it's really a relatively recent part of the Earth. And before the isthmus was there, there was a tropical pointer here. There was a tropical uh, ocean that flowed between the Atlantic and the Pacific. One one ocean that connected the two, and then there was this current that we now know as the Gulf Stream. But back then, when there was no isthmus, it was much much weaker than it is today. Well, beneath the surface of the sea, there were two tectonic plates that were pushing in against each other right at this location. And one of them pushed up against the other one. They pushed the sea floor up to sea level, and then all of that activity also caused volcanoes, sediment, and you wound up with a landmass that connected North and South America. And that was extremely significant because it created what they call the Great American Biotic Interchange. And what that means is the plants and animals from North America were able to make their way to South America and those in South America would make their way to North America. Now, <clears throat> so my wife said, well, how did the plants make it? I said, well, okay, they made it on the backs of the animals, in the hides, or in the intestines, right? But it was a tremendous, created a tremendous amount of biodiversity that would not have happened without the isthmus. So that part of it is tremendously important. But it also, obviously, restricted uh, transportation from the Atlantic Caribbean side to the Pacific side. And it kind of isolated those two populations. But it also dramatically increased the power of the Gulf Stream. And all the sailors out there know how important that is. It affects navigation in the North Atlantic, and it also affects the climate in the United Kingdom and on the continent of Europe. So this tiny little landmass of less than 30,000 square miles has had a tremendous impact on the world. Well, that last point was the one that was of concern to the early Europeans, and particularly this guy, Vasco Nunez de Balboa. He was a Spanish conquistador and explorer in the region uh, at the time after Columbus, which was, of course, 1492. Um, Balboa was around the early 1500s. And they, he and the other uh, Spaniards were operating in the area, the pink area in the, on the map here. And when I say operating, basically what they were doing is plundering the gold from the indigenous people in the area. Um, and one of those uh, people got so indignant about all this that he kicked over their scales that they used to measure the gold. And he said, if you're so hungry for gold that you leave your lands to cause strife in, the, in those of others, I shall show your provinces 
where you can quell this hunger. And so he told Balboa a story of a land where people ate off of golden plates and drank out of golden goblets. Well, for you know, these Spanish conquistadors, he definitely had his interest very quickly. But he said, well, they live in the other sea. And, you know, Balboa's like, what are you talking about the other sea? And so he kind of explained that it was a long way. Of course, he was talking about Peru and the Inca Empire that, that was on the uh, western part of South America. So one thing led to another, and Balboa did an expedition across the Isthmus of Panama and discovered the Pacific Ocean. We always say discovered the Pacific Ocean, but obviously that means for Europe. He discovered, people already knew about the Pacific Ocean, but he discovered it for the Europeans. And once that happened, there was this overwhelming desire to figure out a way to get across the Isthmus more efficiently. Now I can tell you from having been there, it's the jungle all through there, even now with roads and railroads and stuff across it and a canal. It, the rest of it is jungles and mountainous, so it would be really tough back in the early 1500s to get across there. But there was so much interest in this because most of the transportation back then obviously was by ship, especially the long, long uh, trips. And so if you had to come to Panama, disembark, figure out a way to get across the isthmus through the jungle and the malaria and the animals and everything else, and then reload the ships on the other side, it was a complicated endeavor. And if you think about the geography, if you wanted to go from New York to San Francisco, and you had to go all the way around Cape Horn, it's about 12,000 miles. If you could go through a canal across the isthmus of Panama, it's only 4,000 miles. So you not only save 8,000 miles of travel uh, time and fuel and all that, but you also avoid this area down here, which all the sailors in the room probably know is one of the dangerous parts of the world to navigate in. So tremendous interest in trying to figure out a way to get across the canal efficiently. So much so that even King Charles V of Spain back in 1535, that long ago, commissioned a survey of the isthmus to figure out if they could build a canal across the isthmus and, and thereby have their ships go, go right across. Well, that, of course, didn't work out. And in the early 1800s, our own Thomas Jefferson, remember the guy who got us the Louisiana Purchase and saw us as an expanding country across to the Pacific, he said we ought to look into building a canal across the isthmus of Panama. And then what really kicked it off was in the 1840s when the California Gold Rush happened. And all those people that were living on the eastern seaboard suddenly wanted to get over here. And there was no transcontinental railroad at that time. So the only way to get there was to take a boat around and either cross at Panama or Nicaragua, but you had to disembark, figure out a way to get across, and then link up with a boat on the other side or a ship on the other side and make your way up to California. But it cre created a tremendous amount of interest in figuring out a way to get across Panama and a lot of talk about a canal at that point. Well, that was in the 1840s. The first person that actually uh, really took the, the task of building the canal seriously was, oops, wrong way, was this man, Ferdinand de Lessos. And that takes us to the second topic. That's why, apologies, I jumped there. Takes us to the second topic. We now are talking about the canal and what lessons were learned. This man was the first one to take it seriously, Ferdinand de Lessos. He was a French diplomat, but more than that, he was the developer of the Suez Canal. And that was a big deal in its time. It was the biggest engineering achievement of, of its time. When that was completed in 1869. So this is a gentleman who had a lot of authority when he came to the scene and said, I'm thinking about building a canal across the Isthmus of Panama. And so he, was, he formed a French canal company, and he was able to raise a lot of money. This was in the 1880s by this time. And uh, raised a lot of money and started the effort of building the canal with this French canal company. Unfortunately, though, he grossly underestimated the task of building a canal across the Isthmus of Panama. And one of the reasons was he only came to Panama during the dry season. And if anybody's been in a tropical environment before, <coughs> Panama has particularly pronounced seasons. The dry season is really dry, and the rainy season is really rainy. So if he was only there during the dry season, he didn't see the torrential rains, he didn't see the mudslides, he didn't see the swollen rivers. So he didn't have an appreciation for what they were going to have to deal with trying to build a canal across the isthmus. And he wanted to build a sea level canal, you know, just be able to sail in from the Atlantic side and sail over to the Pacific side. That was his idea. 
He also underestimated the geological formations, which were very, very different from the Suez. They had a, a real problem with the, the uh, soil caving in because they couldn't build very sheer uh, faces on the on the canal because it would just cave into the canal. So they had, had to keep digging and digging, and that was a problem. Um, there was also the problem of the Chagres River, which is a big river that runs through Panama, and it went right across the path of what would have been a sea level canal. But the biggest problem they had was they didn't know how to deal with the epidemics of yellow fever and malaria that plagued them. And if you can imagine, their French effort started in the 1880s. It went on for some time. They lost over 25,000 people to disease. So it just decimated them. But what really did them in was, like a lot of things, the Lessif's underestimated. He underestimated how much it was going to cost. So he kept kind of coming back and coming back, trying to raise more money, and that became more difficult. And so there were allegations of bribes, kickbacks, and things like this to, in, in the effort to try to finance the deal. And it ultimately led to criminal convictions of Delesseps and his son and a bunch of other people. And that kind of ended the French effort, fell apart at that point. Well, as soon as the French abandoned the effort, the United States got interested. Um, and by this time, Teddy Roosevelt was president. He was very interested in it. He was a big Navy guy. Um, and the person that was really influential here was this gentleman, Philippe Bonavaria. And he was a French uh, soldier and a French engineer. And he had been involved in the French Canal Company. And he stood to make a lot of money, but only if the, the canal were built across the Panamanian Isthmus as opposed to uh, building it across Nicaragua, which was the competing consideration. So he set about to figure, to convince the United States to build a canal across the business of Panama, and he linked up with a lawyer in New York named William Cromwell. And it's kind of interesting because as a young lawyer, I heard about this New York firm, Sullivan and Cromwell, and it's still in existence. And that is the same William Cromwell who this gentleman linked up with to lobby Congress and convince them to build a canal across the business of Panama. So they did that. And they, they were very successful in getting uh, Congress to, to agree to use Panama as opposed to Nicaragua. And they had all sorts of intrigue in how they did that. But there was one sticking point at this, at this time. Panama was not a separate country at this point. It was part of Colombia. And Colombia was not at all interested in having the United States build a canal across the isthmus. And so, um, <coughs> Maria, not to be deterred, found an independence movement in Panama, and he linked up with them. Now, it was not, it was sort of a ragtag group, but he linked up with them and convinced them that they could s separate from Colombia and become their own country. <coughs> if you can imagine, at the same time, he simultaneously started a revolution to, to have them secede from Colombia. He, and he negotiated a treaty with the United States on behalf of this independence movement, Remember, he's French, not Panamanian. He negotiated a treaty, the Hay Bonavaria Treaty of 1903, which uh, granted Panama its freedom from Mexico or freedom from Colombia, and gave the United States the rights to build a canal, a 10-mile swath of land right through the heart of Panama. You say, well, wait a minute, how do you do that? How do you start a revolution, negotiate a treaty with the United States when Colombia is the one that you know owns the area? Well. He had the help of this guy. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt really wanted this canal. So he sent a U.S. Navy gunboat to the area, the USS Nashville. And Columbia said, I give up. Okay, we'll do it. We get it. It's the first example for you history buffs of gunboat diplomacy. And, uh, and it worked. The, the revolution was almost without a shot. Um, and so Panama became its own country. The United States had sovereign territory of 10 miles wide right through the heart of Panama to build a canal. Then in 19, this was 1903. In 1904, uh, the United States bought the assets of the French company because there was still some usable areas. So they bought that. And they set about to build a canal themselves, ourselves. But they decided against the French design. The French, remember, wanted to build a sea level canal. The Americans realized that wasn't going to work. So they, they adopted instead this proposal, and I'll show you how this works here. Um, they built a series of locks where the ships would come in, go up, stair step up, 
to a large man-made lake, Gatun Lake, and that was um, made by damming up the Shavers River and then stepped down through a series of locks to the other side. And you think, hey, that's pretty slick. You don't have to dig, dig as much. It's a much better design. You don't have to deal with the Shavers River because you're going to dam it up and make a big lake. Uh, you'll be able to control it better. And all the locks are fed off of gravity because the, the lake fills up with water and then the water goes out to sea. So that's, that's how they basically run the locks. There's no pumping. It all works off the, off the rivers. Great design. But that really wasn't the main thing that led to the uh, success of the United States in building the canal. The real problem was that the thing that had decimated the French was the problem of disease. And so the first engineer that was appointed resigned in disgust. It was so hot, it was disease, it was just, it was a mess, and so he quit. And then they appointed this gentleman, John Frank Stevens. And he understood that to build a construction project of this magnitude, which was the largest ever, ever attempted in the world, that you'd have to have a huge ba infrastructure base. And so before he ever started construction, he built warehouses and machine shops and ports and rail railheads and railroads and schools and housing and hospitals and recreation areas, everything you would need to support this huge effort of tens of thousands of people for a long period of time, hospitals and all of that. And they set out, out on a campaign to eradicate the mosquito. They had figured out by this time that mosquito transmitted malaria and yellow fever, and so they had a big sanitation campaign. So he's credited with doing a lot of this. In fact, he is, also says the digging is the least of it all. He understood that there was much more to digging this canal, or creating this uh, Panama Canal, than just digging the dirt. You had to do a lot to have this kind of infrastructure to build it. And so the people give him a lot of credit. What they, he didn't really get credit for though, and I think unfortunately so, is the construction. Because I think he had one of the keen insights that led to the success of the United States in building the canal. And that was he correctly defined the problem. A lot of us have dealt with things before. And you know, sometimes if you correctly define the problem, that's the key. Because if you define the wrong problem, you solve the wrong problem, you haven't really helped yourself. So what Stevens understood, he was an old railroad engineer, and he understood that the problem was not digging the dirt. The problem was getting rid of the dirt. How do you efficiently get it out of the way so you can continue to dig the dirt? He just understood that intuitively, having been a railroad engineer, and was used to dealing with moving things around. So he came up with the idea this was the workhorse of digging the canal. It's Bucyrus 50B, 50 Bravo, uh, steam shovel. They operated on steam, and, and what they had been doing was they would get a big, the French would, they'd get a big head of steam on their steam shovels, they'd pull in a wagon, they'd fill up the wagon with dirt, and then they'd have to wait while it moved out of the way, and then they'd bring in another empty wagon and do the same thing over again. Well, they were losing a head of steam, they were wasting time on doing this. So what Stevens came up with was the idea of putting them on railroad tracks. He mounted them on railroad tracks. And then right here, you can see these are specially designed rail cars. This was ingenious. He created basically a moving conveyor belt that would sit there next to where the steam shovels were digging. They would fill them up, and it, the steam shovel was constantly going all day long. And then when, as soon as the train uh, car got full, full, they would just move it on down. And they just, you can see there's others in uh, other parts of the canal. I've got a short clip here that kind of illustrates how this works. There's the Bucyrus 50B working away. You can see the steam pumping out. Here's the specially designed train cars. And you can see there's more up here. Constantly going and coming back empty, go, or going out loaded, coming back empty. And then the, all these steam engines all throughout the base of the canal. Fascinating uh, solution to the problem. And again, first correctly define the problem. Now, he didn't get to build all this stuff. By the way, they're going into some sort of a way station here. I'm not sure whether they're figuring out where they're going to take this dirt or measure it or what, but there's an important scene after this, and I couldn't cut this part out, so I want you to see this scene in a moment. There'll be a gentleman come up and knock this cable loose. Um, and then you can see his idea for unloading these specially designed cars. But as I say, he wasn't really getting credit for constructing the canal, and he didn't get to build a lot of this. He planned a lot of this, but he didn't get to build a lot of it. They give him credit for the infrastructure stuff, but to me, this was the genius. Okay, here they're unloading it. This is at the Madden Dam, which is the 
was at the time the largest earthen dam in the world, and it's what made Gatun Lake, which at the time was the largest man-made lake in the world. And see how quickly they're unloading all that dirt. This was ingenious. I mean, nobody had ever done anything like this before. They would use hundreds of men with shovels before this. And this was John Frank Stevens's idea. And I think it's an, it's an incredible uh, testament to American ingenuity. Well, for reasons known only to John Frank Stevens, he got burned out, I guess, and he quit, just as the construction was really beginning in earnest. Oh, there's one other scene here I want to show you. That was Madden Dam. This is uh, near Panama, what is now Panama City. And when I was there, it was Fort Amador. There was a string of islands that went out to the Bay of Panama, and they basically connected them with the fill from the canal. So now they have this long causeway on the Pacific entrance to the canal that's made out of fill from where they dug the canal. And again, you can see how efficiently this dirt was unloaded. Fascinating process. Nobody, I mean, we were not, we were not the premier engineers in the world at the time. The French were, but yet we were coming up with these techniques. And you can see there's just a relatively small crew on there unloading all of this dirt. Well, when Stevens quit, it really angered Theodore Roosevelt because he was a very impatient man. He wanted this canal built. In fact, some suspect that he was constantly pushing Stevens to get, get on with the construction while Stevens was building all this infrastructure, and that's what caused the problem. So, in any event, he quit, and Roosevelt is reported to have said, now I'm going to give it to the Army and appoint somebody who can't quit as the chief engineer. Remember, he already had uh, two chief engineers that had quit on him. And the man he selected was this gentleman, George Washington Gerthels. He was a career Army officer, Corps of Engineers. He was a West Point graduate, second in his class, very distinguished officer. He had a very distinguished career. Um, and a very stern fellow, but he was really more engineer than he was soldier. He had, he had worked on a lot of dam projects and canals and all of this sort of stuff that basically was a great uh, prelude to building the Panama Canal. And he oversaw most of the construction of the canal. Uh, he was a very stern man, as you can tell from this picture. And at one point, late in the construction process, um, a bunch of engineers came in and said, Colonel Gerthels, we had another problem, we've got another cave in, uh, you know, it's a huge amount of dirt has come in, it's covered up all these steam shovels, and he's reported to lean back in his chair, lit a cigarette, and said, hell, dig it out. Um, and that was his attitude, it's like, we're not quitting, we're not doing detours, we're not going to wring our hands, get on with it, go dig it out. And dig it out, they did. Um, this is a picture that I took last summer when I was there. Um, you'll notice it looks like stair steps going up on the hillside. That was to keep the, the dirt from caving in. They call it the angle of repose in engineering. If you get it too steep, the dirt just slides in, so you have to back it up. And they came up with this stair step approach. So all, all along the <coughs> canal, anywhere there's a high point, especially in the continental divide area, it's stepped back a long ways. Um, to, to keep those from caving in. As you can imagine, this would necessitate digging a lot more dirt than the French had anticipated, right? And in fact, that is the case. If you're interested in this at all, this is a fantastic book about, I would encourage all, all of you cadets to read this. Uh, for your history classes, if you get an option to read a particular book, this is a very good book to read. Very well written. Um, Path Between the Seas by David McCullough. And he had an interesting quotation in there. So interestingly, the total volume of excavation accomplished since 1904, which is when we began, was 232,440,945 cubic feet. And then they had another 30 million that we could use from the French. So we come up with around 262 million cubic yards of dirt that they moved. Okay, That's more than four times what the French estimated they would take out of a sea level canal. And remember, we didn't build the sea level canal. We had those locks that stepped up to Gatun Lake. Most of the canal is a lake. Now there's a channel that's dug through it, but most of it is a lake. And yet we dug out four times the dirt that the French anticipated and three times what they dug out of the Suez Canal. So it was a monumental effort to get all of that 
dirt moved, and as I mentioned, John Frank Stevens is credited with the idea of figuring out how to move it and get it out of the way efficiently. They still have a problem with cadence. This is a, a video I took last summer um, of a dredging operation. These go on 365 days out of the year in order to keep the channel clear because Panama has a very uh, significant rainy season and it'll pour down and, and erode dirt down into the canal and then there's still the cave-in. So they have to constantly dredge it out and they, they uh, estimate they've taken out more dirt since they built the canal than it took when they built the canal. Now it's been in operation 100 years so a lot of stuff is settled in there. But that gives you an idea of how much dirt they've had to take out of the canal over the years. So, the Americans did it. They built the canal, uh, this upstart country, early 20th century. Uh, we weren't a European power, we were the upstarts over in the Western Hemisphere. And all of a sudden, the whole world's looking at us, that we did something nobody else could do. To give you an idea, a lot of us in this room remember when Neil Armstrong set foot on the, on the moon, and how proud we were in the United States, and what a magnificent achievement that was. This is on a par with that for the early 20th century. Nobody thought we could do it, and we did it. And it was just absolutely magnificent. So we built this large canal administration building on the top of Balboa Heights, still there, and put a big American flag in the front. This is, this is uh, on the Pacific entrance to the canal. You can see it. Uh, and within 10 years, there were 5,000 ships a year going through the canal. And we controlled it all. As I mentioned, it was sovereign U.S. territory, that 10-mile swath of land right through the middle of Panama. Well, that caused some, some difficulty, though. We weren't exactly the greatest of guests in what otherwise was Panama. And you remember how it all started. We sort of thought, well, we got Panama started. We created this country. We got them started from Colombia, so they kind of owe us. Well, that wears thin after decades of time, and people forget that, right? And so we did not involve the Panamanians extensively in operating the canal, and most of the jobs that they had were more menial jobs. The important engineering jobs and those other things all went to Americans. Um, and so it created a good bit of animosity. There were riots at times and, and tension, and it ultimately led to uh, President Carter negotiating a treaty with Omar Torrijos. And what they decided, this was in 1977, and they decided on a transition plan that they would transition from the United States to Panama so that Panama would fully own and fully operate the canal in 1999. Well, I was there from 1982 to 1985, so the transition was already underway. And there was a lot of talk about how, um, you know, the Panamanians are not going to be able to operate it properly, they're not going to do a good job, and all this sort of stuff. Well, that brings us to the third topic, which is how things changed since then. As I mentioned, I was there from January of 1982 to January of 1985. And when I was there, a lot of Panama looked like this. Now, it's not all. There were some affluent areas, and there were some beautiful parks, and of course the natural side of Panama is gorgeous. The, the, the Gatung Lake and the ocean and the beaches and all that stuff are gorgeous. But there was a lot of poverty. There were, the, there were a few people who were rich, and there were a lot of people who were poor. Um, this was not an uncommon kind of site either, especially in downtown Panama City. Well, when I went back last summer with uh, my uh, wife and the, and the mission trip, and then we uh, did some sightseeing, this is what Panama looked like. And uh, it was, it was, we were kind of laughing at dinner. The, the other members of the mission team were laughing at me because I was so excited. They said, look at this, take a picture, take a picture of this, take a picture of this, because it had so dramatically changed since I was there. There was none of this in Panama when I was there. This is all probably less than 15 years old. This, this is the Panamanian skyline now. This is a view from the top of the hotel we stayed in, looking across the Bay of Panama at these skyscrapers. It looks like a little Manhattan. Uh, it's phenomenal. And that's not all they've done. Also some fantastic, crazy architecture they have. Um, but that's not all they've done. They also built uh, another bridge across the canal. Uh, there is a vibrant middle class now where there was not, there was virtually none when I was there. Now you drive up the road and you see shopping centers and housing and all these sorts of things that uh, they, they have a much uh, larger middle class than they used to have. They still have this though. My wife and I rode in a dugout canoe up the Chagas River 
and visited a, um, a, a real Indian village. And the Panamanian government lets them continue to live that way because they're happy and content and they want, they want to preserve their traditions and the heritage and all of that. And they're relatively healthy, uh, amazingly. They make a little bit of money off of the tourists who come up there. But for the most part, they live off of the land. They fish and they uh, get food out of the jungle. They don't even really farm. They just uh, get things out of the jungle. And they, they live pretty well. They make a little bit of money, as I say, on the tourists. And the little girls like uh, the lollipops that we bring. Um, as I mentioned, there is uh, a new set of locks. One of the biggest developments that um, Panama has done since they took over was to build this new set of locks. And it can handle much larger ships. Um, I, I actually added this slide because I knew I was in front of a bunch of Navy guys and you were going to ask me how big the ships were. So um, this is a chart showing the old Panamax. That was as large as the lock chamber was. So that's as large a ship as you could put in it. And that was what would go through there when I was there. So a lot of ships out in the ocean could not get through the canal because the, the lock chambers were too small. So this new set of locks, they call them Neo Panamax, and it's tw you can have a ship 1,200 feet long, 160 feet wide, and with a draft of 50 feet. So much larger than the other uh, locks. Now they still use the other locks, and, and I'm proud to say, as a, as a West Point graduate, designed by West Point engineers, they're still operating 100 years later, <coughs> the same way they were operating when they met. They were made originally. They work, they work great. A lot of it works on gravity, and they use uh, the water from Lake Katoon. One of the problems with the, um, the new locks, though, is you can see these big areas on the side. This, this area here, those are not the locks. This is the lock right here. What that is, is they're trying to reclaim some of the water. Because one of the problems is, especially during the dry season, if Lake Gatun gets down too far, because remember, all that water goes out. They collect it in Lake Gatun, but when a ship goes out in the chamber, all that works on gravity. There's valves that bring the water in and raise them up and lower them down. But it all works on gravity, then all that water winds up going out to the ocean. So if they get low on water and Lake Gatun gets too low, then it, it interferes with the channel. So they tried on this new design to reclaim some of that water in these, in these pools. That's what that is. There are, um, one other thing about the new canals, uh, or the new uh, lots, is we, didn't, we weren't involved in that at all. Um, it was a consortium of European companies. I think uh, the lead was a Spanish company that actually built it. We weren't, in, as I say, not involved, not consulted at all. And that's kind of disappointing. For a long time there, from basically 1903 until way up into the 90s, um, you know, you would think we'd have better relations. But as I alluded to earlier, we didn't. We weren't always good guests in Panama, and I think there was a lot of hostility. So once we were gone, they didn't really want to talk to us. And what's particularly disturbing for me is there have been reports now that Panama is cozy enough to the communist Chinese. Because if you think about it, Panama is one of the most strategic points in the, on the entire globe. Um, in terms of uh, you know uh, commercial traffic and, and also naval vessels, uh, and for a country like the United States, a two ocean country, that's particularly important. Um, and yet we don't have the best of relationships with Panama, and they are, as I say, cozy enough to China. And as we all know, China's got all kinds of designs on on being a uh, strategic power in the world. So that's a little, little disconcerting. My hope is that those relationships can be improved and uh, we can kind of go back and uh, have a, a much warmer, better relationship with Panama. That actually concludes my formal remarks and I would love to take some questions if anybody has any. History or otherwise? Yes? So, um, I know that a lot of people, including myself, were really mad when Carter turned it back over to the Panamanian. And I know that President Reagan made a comment about, hey, we bought it, we built it, we should own it. Um, so how do you think that has affected everything today? That is a very, very good question. And one I think all Americans I think about really hard. If you had asked me before I went down there, I would have said, you know, what Reagan says makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, we pay for it. After living down there, though, um, what I discovered is, and I, as I mentioned a couple times, we weren't the best guests. And you can say, you know, all you want, well, we paid for it, it's ours. 
But it's sort of like having that nasty neighbor down the street. I mean, it is his property, but nobody likes him, and they'll be glad when he leaves or dies. Um, because, you know, it's just as miserable to be around. Well, that's kind of the way we were. We didn't involve the Panamanians in anything. We didn't give them any good jobs. Uh, if a Panamanian were to come into the canal zone, that 10-mile swath, uh, they'd often get, get questioned, let me see your ID and all this sort of thing. The only ones that really got in were maids and gardeners and things like that. So it created a lot of hostility. And um, if you, uh, the book that Kathy mentioned, I, I talk a little bit about that. They were called the Zonians. The Zonians were the Americans that lived in the canal zone that operated the canal. And you think about it, we had all these Panamanians there. They had engineers and all the electricians and all that other stuff too, but we had people come from the United States, live in the canal zone, and some of these were generational. They lived there. You know, they, they were born there, their parents were born there, and they lived there a long time, even though they were Americans, because that was sovereign U.S. territory. Um, I think we could have done a much better job of involving the Panamanians. We could have done a much better job of sharing the millions and millions and billions of dollars we made off of the canal. Because remember I said they had 5,000 ships a year going through there, and each one of those paid a pretty hefty toll to go through the canal. So it was generating a ton of money. Um, and that poverty that I saw, maybe some of that could have been rectified with some of those, some of that revenue. So Reagan makes a good point, but um, but the other part of it is you think historically. Remember I mentioned Philippe Bunavaria. He was not even a Panamanian. He wasn't a Colombian. He was French, and he also stood to make a lot of money personally if that treaty got negotiated. And yet he's the one that negotiated on behalf of this independence movement. So he wasn't the most. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Did, didn't have the most of a fiduciary role for the for the rest of Panama. He was really looking out for himself. And uh, so you combine that with our behavior following that, and having that big American flag up there, that that irritated them a lot. I know it was when I was there, we still had the American flag up there, and uh, they were not happy about it. Um, at one point in the 60s, uh, a group of Panamanian kids came up with a chainsaw and cut the cut the flagpole down, create a huge riot. Uh, but it was like a stick in their eye, because when you come into the Pacific side of the canal, first thing you saw was this big American flag, nothing about Panama. So I think it was a mistake, and, I, and you know, whether things could have been turned around, I don't know, maybe they could have, but it, it, it would have taken a lot of work uh, and a lot of time to kind of turn that back around. Yes, sir. So the, the infrastructure that Stevens put in there, that was actually just in the zone. It wasn't for Panama, it was for... Correct. Yeah, it was just to support the effort of building the canal. Now, they did, and they, the other thing is they imported a lot of workers, too. So a lot of the workers that were imported on the, on the Atlantic side got imported from the Caribbean islands, and they had uh, Asian workers on the Atlantic side in America. Um, not a ton of Panamanians. Some. But not a ton. But more importantly, though, is after it was built, there were a lot of things that Panamanians could have done, good jobs. And they instead gave them jobs cutting grass and things like that instead of electricians and machine shops and things like that, which would have, I think, helped a lot. Okay, you kids are all in school. You gotta, this is history time, right? <laughs> yes, sir? When, when you saw that stair step. Did they raise the railroad when they were dumping the the dirt to get that back. That's a dirt. very interesting question. Um, no, the railroad was at the, is at the bottom of the canal. And when I was there, you could go scuba diving and go down about 100 feet. And you could see the old railroad and even some of the rail cars. And they just left them. Once they, once they closed up the dam and flooded it, they just left. It was worn out anyway, but they just left the equipment down there. It wasn't in the channel, so it didn't matter. Now they're fishing. Yes, ma'am. And you said that, that now they still have to dredge out the canal and take dirt out of it because as it comes in from the, you know, as it comes through the rainy season, where do they take the soil that they're dredging out of it now? Where do they take that? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, there are, there are much more ecologically uh, sensitive areas that they take it to, but it's the same. Now, remember, they don't have as much to take out at, at, at any given time. That statistic about taking out as much dirt, that's over the life of the canal, so it's been a long time. But they do take out a lot of dirt, um, and you know they just have areas where they haul it off to and dump it down in ravines. 
but they, I, I, there's a lot more sensitivity to the ecology. Which, by the way, if you ever get a chance to go to Panama, it's a wonderful ecological uh, ex exploration as well, up in the, the northwestern part of Panama. It's absolutely stunning, gorgeous. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this might be a silly question, but I have a friend that's going on a carnival cruise, and they're going to Panama uh, through the canal, and then they go halfway into the canal, and then they turn around and come back. So my question is, is there a channel that goes one way and then a channel like a street where it's... Yeah, yeah what, when is she starting where? Um, they're starting in uh, Galveston or Florida, Okay, so they're going to start on the Caribbean yeah. side of it. Yeah. Well, that's not uncommon because they pay less to do that. Um, and the, the way that works is time of day, which way they're going. Um, but it's not uncommon to do that uh, because once you get all the way over to California, how are you going to get them back? You have to come back well, how, through. How are they going to get? It's a big ship. Oh yeah, it's big. The lake is huge. The lake is enormous. The lake's enormous. So, so they just turn around in the lake. The lake and then go back. Yeah, oh. the lake is enormous. When I was there, uh, you could go skiing out in the lake, and you know you could come come around the point, you know, skiing behind the boat. All of a sudden, there's this massive ocean-going wow. ship right in the middle of the lake. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Sir. So I've done I've done exactly what uh -huh. she's doing. Um, you go because if you went all the way, you get charged twice. Oh. So you get a one way passage if you go through the lock, stop, and then go back out. Tell her to get a tour that then will then. She's coming in from the eastern side, I assume, yeah. not Miami, more likely. Right. So you want to see the Miraflores Locks. You want to see the western. It's beautiful over there. You can get a, a tour on a small boat. And, and you'll go through the you go through the locks on the other side. Yeah, I did that last summer. The, the other thing the Pan Mains had done is they built a big visitor center at the Miraflores Locks, which wasn't there. Again, something the Americans could have done, but we didn't do. Um, big, huge visitor center where you can you can get up high and look down on the on the chambers of the locks as the ships are coming through. It's fascinating to watch, and they have a small museum there as well. Interestingly, in the museums, and I I kept looking at this. There's a very little mention of the effort of the United States. It's, uh, they talk about the French, and they talk, yeah, the United States did some stuff, and then now we've built this other set of uh, locks. So it's, it's clear what, what the sentiment, where the sentiments lie. Yes, sir? How much did the uh, eradication of the disease uh, help in the future of Panama? Uh, the Panama of the country? Oh, yes. I think in a huge way. Um, when I was there, there was still a, a, an aggressive uh, sanitation campaign. Um, and of course, the America, a lot of the Americans in the Canal Zone are living there right next to Panama City, so they benefited from it as well. I mean, we were, they were doing crazy things like they would have people in a hospital bed and they were worried about fire ants, so they put the legs of the beds in a pot of water. Well, where do mosquitoes breed? In water, right? And so it was just compounding the problem. Well, a lot of that education, and those sanitation programs, and the water. You could drink the water in Panama uh, because of the Americans built the water systems. So in Panama City, now I don't know about out in the countryside, I probably wouldn't do it, but in Panama City, the water's safe to drink. Anybody else? Yes, sir. So I know there's an Army jungle training center down there. I was there in 2013. The Navy base was shut down. Uh, I talked to a lot of military group doing like a joint operation down there on solar duty. They were complaining that the all the Americans left a solar panel farm. Look at it, it's still out there, sitting out there. It's all contaminated. So I understand where you're coming from as far as we didn't, you know, do enough to, to help them out. Did the bases close at the same time? It was a phase thing. My base uh, where I was was Fort Clayton, and it's now. It's, I went there last summer. It's interesting. It's uh, they've taken all the buildings and converted them. My office now houses a UN office uh, building. There's some technology companies out there. Because you had all these facilities, uh, you know, uh, cafeterias and housing and offices and uh, athletic fields and all that, swimming pools, barracks. So they've turned it into a, sort of a technology park, but there's also like, um, the, as I said, the UN is in there. Interesting, they were nice enough to me. They let me go up to the floor where my old office was so I could look out the window. Same view I had when I was there. Uh, all these all those years ago, so it was kind of neat. Um, but I, you mentioned uh, the Navy being there. I have to tell this one quick story. Um, I was an Army captain then, okay? So we would call up the Rodman, which is the Naval base, 
And we say, we want to sign up to get a tee time to play golf on, on the course. And they say, who is this? And we'd say, Captain Venema. And they go, oh, okay, okay. Because they're thinking I'm at 06. They don't realize it. So they got wise to us, though. And then they said, so now, are, where, are you, where are you stationed? Are you uh, on Rodman? You know, and then, of course, the jig was up. But. <laughs> yes, sir. What was the impact of the whole Noriega situation? That, that was interesting. I actually got, sort of got to meet him. Um, when he, um, Omar Torrios died in a plane crash um, just shortly before I arrived. Um, and a lot of people suspect Noriega was behind that. And then he was the strong man that kind of took over. So at the time, the United States was still trying to work with him uh, for drug interdiction and other reasons. So we had this big uh, reception for him at Fort Amador's Officers Club, and he, he and his staff were there, and you know we were you know dressed up in our dress uh, uniforms and went through the receiving line and had dinner and all that stuff. It didn't take long for that to sour, though, because he was playing both sides against each other. Um, but um, he, he was just a disreputable guy, you know, not anybody you could count on. Um, and if you can imagine, he looked worse in person than he did in pictures. Um, and, you know, he got convicted uh, and sentenced in the United States, but then France also got him on charges. Uh, he wound up dying in, um, uh, from complications, I think, of, uh, recently, uh, but he was in prison in Panama. Uh, now, were you asking about getting rid of Noriega, how that helped? Is that was that sort of the gen well I mean I think what what's the reflection of the Noriega crisis with the stability of the, the Panamanian rule yeah I think I think that actually was a big positive for us because the Panamanians you know except for his loyal cadre uh, they wanted him gone um, and as a consequence you can see the pictures I showed you Panama's a lot better place than it was when Noriega was running the show um, Part of that is that they have control of the canal now, but also the, you, you don't have the, um, they had the Guardia Nacional when I was there, and you, you know, you almost felt in fear of being around the Guardia Nacional. They don't even have that anymore. It doesn't exist. So I think the Panamanians are pleased to be rid of it. Yeah. Yes, sir. What, what, did, what did you get the uh, China with our leg up? Right? They just like Chinese or well, they were cozy with, with Taiwan, and then I guess China said, look, if you want our help, you're going to have to get rid of that and cozy up to us. I think the China, yeah, it's money uh, and trade, and um, I think China just wants the influence of this very strategic point in the world. Now, they're not there yet. I mean, they don't, they don't, I don't want to suggest that they have this really, really close relationship with Panama, but it's, it's disturbing to me that they're, you know, where they had none before, now they have this... Uh, you know, growing relationship. Yes, ma'am. So when uh, when a ship goes, one of the smaller ships goes through the canals between three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars just to go one way through it. If you're a big ship, it's between seven hundred thousand and eight hundred thousand. But yet, when we were there for that mission trip, we took drugs over-the-counter Tylenol and Advil, most common basic things to the poor of Panama. What are they, why are they not benefiting some of their people, just the general population with something like over-the-counter drug? What are they yeah. spending their money on? Yeah, well, you saw part of it in Panama City, the new bridge, uh, the skyscrapers. I don't want to suggest that it's all good. Um, but I'll tell you, it, you know, everything's kind of relative, right? When I was there, it was really bad. There was not a lot of opportunity for poor people at all. And when we went on that mission trip, we were in, in, a, in a poor, very poor area. But if you're in Panama City, it, it's a lot better. There's a lot more opportunity there now for jobs and, and training and all that sort of thing. And when you take, when they took that road up to where we went to Santiago, um, those shopping centers and those housing, none of that existed. It was just shacks and little bitty uh, huts on the side of the road where they'd sell Coca-Cola. I mean, that was it. There weren't any shopping centers or housing mills like that at all. So is it perfect now? No, but it's a lot better than it was. And I, you know, the problem with all of the, those areas down there is that, you know, like our own government, uh, you know, things don't always run the way it 
the way they should. Uh, and even though they're getting a lot more money now, probably not all of it gets to where it needs to go, but it is substantially better than it was. I think Kathy is ready to end it. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it.